This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Richard Minns was a flashy bodybuilding millionaire who always got what he wanted. In 1977, he set his sights on Barbara Petrovsky, a former beauty queen from California. Three years later, their love affair disintegrated, and Barbara descended into a personal hell, which culminated in a brutal attack. For years, Catherine Bennett lived in virtual seclusion, apparently on the edge of poverty. When she died, she left behind a past shrouded in mystery and an estate worth more than $125,000. Perhaps someone watching tonight is a rightful heir. Also, we'll update you on the unusual case of a Canadian man who disappeared in 1987. Thanks to our broadcast, he has finally been located and reunited with his family. Join me. Perhaps you may solve a mystery. Annie Smith of Irvine, California is a registered nurse, a marathon racer, and a new bride. She is also paralyzed from the chest down, the result of a brutal attack. Fifteen years ago, Janie had another name, Barbara Petrovsky, and another life. She was a beauty queen and a straight-A pre-med student. In 1977, she became involved in a passionate, obsessive love affair with a man twice her age. By 1979, that love affair began to self-destruct. Barbara Petrovsky found herself embroiled in a bitter dispute with her former lover, Richard Minns. Minns, a multimillionaire from Texas, was the one man Barbara had loved unconditionally, the man whose child she had carried, the man who had promised her a bright and limitless future. Incredibly, she is certain that the attack which left her paralyzed was a murder attempt, and that Richard Minns was responsible. They met in January of 1977 on the ski slopes of Aspen, Colorado. Barbara Petrovsky was just 23 and admittedly naive. Richard Minns was 47, a sophisticated, smooth-talking chameleon who could adjust to any situation. Richard Minns, when he first approached me, was very loud and belligerent. He was dressed very loudly in a bright fluorescent yellow ski suit. Uh, he was uh, bragging about what a great guy he was. And we, when he saw how that affected me, he just very, very quickly changed his, his persona and was very quiet, charming, uh, almost seemed a little shy. And eventually I did, not only I didn't just fall in love with him, I fell head over heels in love with him. Richard Minns was anything but shy. He was a dedicated, flamboyant bodybuilder who'd made millions from a chain of upscale health spas based in Texas. Minns was a man who always got what he wanted, and he wanted Barbara. What's the two most beautiful moments you've known in the last four months? Oh, Aspen, two. in March, and um, <laughs> Acapulco. Within three months, Barbara Petrovsky had moved from Los Angeles to Houston to live with Richard Minns. He hired her as a model for his health spas, lavished her with attention, and in general made her the center of his life. Minns even bragged that his contacts guaranteed Barbara a spot in medical school. It was incredibly romantic and it was too good to be true. You know, things like this don't happen in real life. They happen in a story, they happen in a movie, but they don't happen to you. And I felt so incredibly lucky. 
I mean, we seemed to have a very good relationship. Certainly it was uh, magical. So there was no indication whatsoever in the beginning that there was anything that was really amiss. My husband is in your house, and I want to see him right now. I know he's here. I saw his car. Richard Minns had neglected tell to tell Barbara him. one small right detail. Now. I'll go get him. Dick! He was married. You better get out of here right now! At that point, he explained to me that he had loved me so much that he knew if he had admitted that he was not divorced, that I never would have consented to come to Houston, and that he loved me so much that he would have done anything. He would have even compromised his own integrity and lie to me uh, because he loved me so much that he wanted to convince me to come to Houston to be with him. And he explained that he was legally separated, but not divorced. After a short breakup, Barbara decided to accept Richard's explanation and his peace offering, a townhouse for the it's two beautiful. of them to share. Yeah. Beautiful. To prove his devotion, Minns even gave Barbara papers stating that the townhouse and its contents belonged to her. I decided to do something with this that I he really didn't want me to be working for anyone other than him. Um, this was his way of dealing with that, was by giving me every assurance that these were things I didn't have to worry about, that instead I should concentrate on, uh, on our relationship, on... Uh, finishing my own education and not worrying about holding down a job that wouldn't pay me nearly what he could make in a day. Six months later, Barbara discovered that Richard Minns was not legally separated. In May of 1978, his wife filed for divorce after she found out about the townhouse arrangement. When Dick was going through his divorce, he just became a completely different person, and it was something that um, really shocked me. It really appalled me. How does something like this happen right now with everything? Suddenly, I saw uh, a very paranoid, violent uh, side of his personality. Barbara, will you stop it? What do you know? What, this silly little thing you blame school, you think that has something to do with, you think it has something to do with economics? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it! Ah! Richard Min's temper became worse and worse, especially after the divorce settlement was finalized. His wife, who built the health spa business with him, was awarded nearly $6 million. Barbara, I don't want to talk. At around the same time, Barbara had discovered she was pregnant. Min suddenly put his plans to marry her on hold. Yeah, I'll give you something. I you here. Yes! Dick, will you just calm down, please, and be careful? Remember, I told you I, told you I was pregnant. Good, good, good. Right, I told you that. Abort it. No. I don't want No! To. Abort. I Abort. won't abort it. I'm not I'm going not to. having a child. I don't want it. I thought we Abort were going to have a family! Get out of my house! You hear me, Barbara? Yeah, the couch is definitely, yeah, no, right. not the piano no, I, or, or the clock. All right, we won't take the clock. Barbara feared for herself and her unborn child. In a panic, she decided to move out. Barbara took almost everything in the townhouse. At the time that I decided to leave, my emotional state was one of complete confusion. I didn't know if I was doing the right thing. I didn't want to be doing what I was doing. I really didn't want to, at this point even, I still didn't want to leave him, leave him. It was as if I was tearing myself away from part of myself. I was ripping my own arm off. When Barbara moved out of the townhouse, she took all of the furniture in the townhouse with her. Some of these items... Suzanne Finstead spent more than three years researching and writing pilot. Sleeping with the Devil, the book which pieces together the complex story of Richard and Barbara. Her, ...for which she had receipts. She did this thinking she needed to do something to jolt him because she'd moved out several other times and the relationship had pretty much remained the same and she felt she needed to get his attention in a, a very dramatic way, which unfortunately she did. Barbara? Barbara? 
Barbara! Barbara went into hiding. Richard Minns was furious. He had lost his wife and half his fortune. Now Barbara. He had called his sister, begging her to have me come meet him uh, on a particular evening. And even though I knew that it was a big mistake, I felt as if I had to at least see what he had to say. When Barbara arrived at Richard's hotel room, he wasn't there. Hoping they could work something out, she waited in the hallway until well after midnight. See? Yes, no, no. No. Tell me. No. Yes. Whoa. Come on. Come on. Barbara. I can see it didn't take you very long. Barbara, wait. I thought you wait, said wait, you loved me. Wait, wait, wait. Wait a minute. I wanted you to come here. Wait. Barbara. He grabbed me first forcibly and wouldn't allow me to leave. And then while he held me forcibly, begged me to just come in and talk, said that he still loved me. We, we had a lot to talk about, that somehow or another, if we just sat down and talked, that we could work things out. So he brought me in to uh, his suite, and um, we started to talk a little bit. OK. So. He put his arms around me, was telling me how much he loved me, and all of a sudden, the door burst open. It was the police. He threw me from his arms toward them and said, take her. You have a, have warrant, a warrant for her arrest. Call him if you don't believe it. She's an employee of mine. She stole my jewelry, oh, stole my shotgun. Barbara had been set up. Minns had on. used his connections to obtain a warrant for her arrest. One of his associates had called the police. Are you going to take her away? What are we standing here talking? Don't you got tell me how to do my job. It's a valid warrant signed by a judge. I'm going to have well, to arrest Well, it's not her. true. God, Sorry. Richard, this man is lying. What he did to me that night Why was like taking a knife and just ripping my heart straight open. But believe it or not, even after what he did that night, I was still in love with him. Four and a half hours later, at daybreak, Barbara was visited by a police detective. Barbara? Yeah. Barbara Trotsky? Mm -hmm. How you doing? Doing you okay? No. How about a smoke? No, thank you. Listen, Barbara, I heard about your case, and I thought I'd come down here and see if I couldn't give you a hand. How? Well, if you'll settle up with Dick Mans, we can forget about this whole thing. What are you talking about? Well, I've got a little piece of paper here. You read this, you sign it, we can wipe the slate clean. Get you out of here tonight. The Did detective carried a statement which he said Richard Minns wanted Barbara to sign. That I never knew Richard Minns, that I never had a relationship with him and I'm not carrying his child? No, I'm gonna sign it. Some money in there for you? No, it's lies. Think about it. I have. Okay then. Barbara Petrowski was formally charged with felony grand theft and aggravated assault because she had slapped at Richard Minns with her purse in the hotel. Less than 36 hours later, Barbara miscarried. She told her doctors, but not Richard Minns. I think that uh, Dick Minns got the arrest warrant, got the attention of the authorities because of who he was. Uh, because it's always been my opinion that the district attorney's office would never take any charge unless they felt that they could make a prima facie case and get a conviction. And I felt, when I reviewed these facts, that this would be an easy case to defend. Have you been up? Have you been to the door? Any? Just Barbara was released and again Just went into hiding. She's going to be here in a second. You asked me to do a job, I did a job. Earlier, Minns had hired a private investigator named Dudley Bell, who was notorious for operating on the edge of the law. Bell had no trouble finding Barbara, and the police were close behind. Don't touch me. On April 17, 1980, two Houston police detectives served Barbara with a search warrant. 
We'll have somebody up here in a minute to identify. Hey, why is he going in there? I just have a look around. All right. Barbara was about to find out that Richard Mins had engineered the entire episode. Also, I want my attorney here, okay? I'm going to wait for him. If you want to call I don't want him in here. I don't want to be standing out here all day long. I don't want him in this place! Come on in, Dick. This is my place. These are my things. got a warrant. Just get the couch out right now. Start with that. Those are my things. Both the couches are mine. The table is the dishwasher. You gave all this stuff to me. Get all this off paper. Get these movers in here. Richard Minns put the furniture in storage. He continued to demand that Barbara sign papers promising never to sue him. Just, just calm down. He wanted a finality of their relationship, and he wanted it in writing, and he wanted the peace of mind, I guess, in his, that he considered was uh, necessary for him to go on without any concerns about her instituting any litigation with respect to a marriage or paternity. Barbara Petrovsky's fairy tale romance with Richard Minns had disintegrated into a nightmare. I had been told by people who knew him well that he was so embarrassed and angry that I had left him that he had to teach me a lesson and that he had to teach everyone else a lesson. I told her to be careful, to not be alone, to uh, watch what she did and where she went. Unfortunately, no safeguard is enough. If someone's after you, they can find a way to get you. Good evening. Hi. How can I help? I want to get um, an apple fritter, please. Finally, on October 20th, 1980, Barbara's love affair with Richard Minns reached its violent climax in the parking lot of a Houston donut shop. Here you go. Two That'll be a dollar. As I was getting back into my car, a black man approached me, and I knew, I knew immediately what was going to happen. It was essentially the moment that I had been afraid of. Barbara Petrovsky was shot four times and left for dead. The bullets collapsed her lungs and severed her spinal cord, leaving her paralyzed from the chest down. Initially, it seemed that Barbara Petrovsky was a victim of a random street crime. Nothing could have been further from the truth. Miraculously, on the night of the attack, Barbara never lost consciousness. When paramedics asked who was responsible, she gave the name of her former lover, Richard Minns. Within minutes of the shooting, two small-time hoods from California, Nathaniel Ivory and Patrick Steen, were arrested for attempted murder to do a lot of time. Under interrogation, they were closed mouthed and gave no support to Barbara's contention that Richard Minns was involved. I don't know, man. Oh, no. Then the following night, detectives met with one of Richard Minns' former bodyguards. I want to know if you were hired to The man refused to go public, but claimed that one month earlier, a contract had been put out on Barbara's life. Ten grand. By who? Dudley. Dudley who? Come on, man. How many Dudleys do you know? Dudley Bell. OK. So who does Dudley Bell work for? He works for Richard Minns. So did Richard Minns offer you the money? No, man. Dudley did. Dudley works for Richard. One plus one equals two, man. The next day, Police learned that a California trucker named Robert Jess Anderson owned a getaway car used by Steen and Ivory. A guy named Anderson hired us, Bob Anderson. Bob Anderson. Steen and Ivory were questioned again. They identified Robert Jess Anderson as the man who had hired them to kill Barbara. going to pay us. Then he gave us a gun and said it would be better if she was dead. I just happened to notice a little, little note here. And the following day, Dudley Bell's ex-wife gave police a note which seemed to connect Richard Minns and Dudley Bell with Robert Jess Anderson. The note, printed in Dudley Bell's own hand, was on Richard Minns' hotel stationery. A list of guns, which later turned out to belong to Robert Jess Anderson, was on the back. On October 28, 1980, eight days after Barbara had been shot, 
Police arrested Robert Jess Anderson on charges of conspiring to commit a murder. Can wait outside for this? What is your relationship with Patrick Steen and Nathaniel Ivory? Relationship? I mean, I don't know from no relationship. I mean, you, you, you throw these names at me, I don't know from any relationships. With what I have, the fact they have confessed, they have implicated you, they were apprehended while driving your car, it all boils down to one thing, Mr. Anderson, is we've got you. Their testimony and the other evidence is that strong. I happen to be in a position to cut you a deal to where you will more than likely not serve any, any time at all for this crime. If you'll cooperate with me and give me the information that I want to know. Yeah, sure. What do you want to know? But we solicited at that time his cooperation because the information that we had in this particular case certainly indicated that there were people far above Robert Jess Anderson that were involved. And we felt that it was necessary to uh, get his assistance to try to move up that letter. Well, I, I tell you, Dudley's private eye, you know, and he was working for this guy. Anderson says, confirmed that it was Dudley Bell like who had hired him. Anderson also admitted that he, in turn, had approached Steen and Ivory so to make the hit. To make the but he said he called it off in the end. Anderson suspected that Dudley Bell was working for Richard Mins, but he had no proof. He stiffed me for the bill. How about that, you know? Despite Anderson's cooperation, the DA claimed he simply did not have enough evidence to indict either Dudley Bell or Richard Mins. In fact, throughout the entire investigation, Mins was never questioned once. Amazingly, he continued to press a theft case against Barbara. She appeared in court on November 17, 1980, less than one month after the shooting, which Mins now insisted Barbara's new attorney had staged as a publicity stunt. Mr. DeGuerin, I understand you have a motion to present today. Yes, Your Honor. We'd like for you to rule on our motion to suppress. I was shot. I was paralyzed. I was sitting in the wheelchair. He wasn't being questioned. He wasn't being indicted. Neither were, were any of the other people who were involved, yet here I was sitting in a courtroom, my first trip out of the hospital, facing theft charges that he had fabricated. I have your motion. Barbara would never get the chance to prove that she was innocent. The theft charges were dropped on a technicality involving the search warrant. Thank you, Your Honor. On March 30th, 1981, Nathaniel Ivory and Patrick Steen were convicted of attempted murder. Each was sentenced to 35 years in prison. Just over one year later, Barbara Petrosky filed a civil suit for wrongful injury against Richard Minns and his alleged confederates, Steen, Ivory, Anderson, and Bell. Before depositions could be taken, Richard Minns left the country and disappeared. He has been in hiding ever since, evading the civil suit by pleading ill health, even though witnesses reported him water skiing in the Bahamas. Richard Mins remains a suspect in this case, unfortunately, an unindicted suspect in this case, because we don't have sufficient evidence in order to indict nor try Richard Mins for the offense. There have been many cases of indictments returned in Harris County on less evidence than the state has against Dick Mins. Uh, I don't know why Dick Mins hasn't been charged. He should have been, and no fair jury that hears that case would find anything other than Dick Mins was responsible. In 1984, the FBI, in an unrelated investigation, tape recorded Robert Jess Anderson bragging about the Petrovsky hit. He was subsequently convicted of soliciting a murder and sentenced to 38 years. Dudley Bell was also arrested for soliciting a murder. In 1987, he was convicted when one of his former employees testified in court that Bell had tried to hire him to kill Barbara Petrovsky. Like Anderson, Dudley Bell was sentenced to 38 years. He was released on parole in 1991 after serving only four and a half years. There's nothing new before this court on this motion, and the court is noting at this time, and I want the record to show, on 17 consecutive occasions, Richard Minns failed to appear in court to respond to Barbara Petrovsky's civil suit. Already presented to this court, 
Ultimately, Mills was found in default, and a jury ordered him to pay Barbara more than $50 million. The amount of $58 million plus costs. That will be all, gentlemen. It is a civil judgment against Richard Menz. It's a, a curiosity of the law that one could get a civil judgment against someone and not a criminal judgment. But that's what's happened in this particular case. All of the responsible parties in the shooting of Barbara Piotrowski have not been indicted and have not been convicted and sent to the penitentiary. Uh, at least four of them have. And uh, I think it's a consensus in the DA's office and and the homicide division that there is at least one uh, a person still there, uh, a higher person than anybody else uh, that has not been indicted and has not been convicted. And uh, until that happens, uh, this case will not close. Barbara set about rebuilding her life. She changed her name to Janny Smith and eventually moved to Ohio. Above all, she refused to accept the limitations of her paralysis. You cannot go through something as devastating as what happened to me and dwell on it. You cannot, if you do, if you dwell on it, it will destroy you. You have to go on. You have to find a way to find meaning in life, to do something meaningful with your life. And I swore when I was shot that if I lived through it, that I would find a way to make my life rewarding, fulfilling, and productive. And I've tried to do that since the time of my injury. In 1983, Barbara, now Janny Smith, began rehabilitation with Dr. Gerald Petrovsky, who was experimenting with a device which allows a paralyzed person to walk independently. As collaborators, they perfected the system. It operates by means of computer-induced electrical impulses, Today, Janny Smith is president and co-founder of the Petrovsky Centers in Irvine, California, and Scranton, Pennsylvania. As a nurse, she works personally with patients at the centers, especially children. On November 30th, 1991, Janny Smith and Dr. Gerald Petrovsky were married. It was a remarkable turn of events for a woman who had been left paralyzed and near death by an assassin's bullet. Richard Minns has been seen in Texas, the Caribbean, Israel, and London, but is based in Switzerland. Minns has also changed his name. Today he goes by Richard O'Toole and bills himself as an international tax attorney. Minns has reportedly transferred all his assets offshore to dummy corporations. Janny Smith has never collected a penny. Next, the search for the heirs of an elderly recluse who left an estate worth more than $125,000. It seems like every town in America has a village recluse, a mysterious soul who chooses to remain alone, isolated from the community. Catherine Bennett of Portland, Oregon, was just such a person, an eccentric, nearly destitute pack rat who dressed in men's clothing, rarely left her home, and refused to discuss her past with anyone. For years, Catherine Bennett was viewed with curiosity by sympathetic neighbors. What no one suspected was that Catherine had amassed a modest fortune worth more than $125,000. But on the day she died, Catherine Bennett was a woman with few friends and no family. Perhaps one of our viewers can help find the heir to her estate. Little is known about Catherine before 1941. That year, she met a handsome young soldier named Gilbert Bennett. Six months later, they were married. After the Second World War, the couple settled in Portland, Oregon, where Gilbert worked as a commercial photographer Catherine became his favorite subject. Uh, oh, yeah, this is the spot. The two shared a love for the great outdoors. 
At every opportunity, they would escape to the unspoiled rivers of the Pacific Northwest. It's beautiful. I can smell the fish. You can, huh? Mm -hmm. They love the outdoor smell. life, and uh, they fished I'm every chance like that they get. Yes. They're very devoted to each other. Yeah. Truly. <laughs> Good girl. They were inseparable. Every place they went, they went together, and they fished together, and they hunted together, and what have you. I'm sure that they were very much in love with each other. Gilbert and Catherine never had children. Instead, they built a loving private universe for two. Catherine lavished attention upon her husband, her garden, and her pets. Yet she remained intensely private about her past. She never spoke of a past. And uh, I have since talked to all my brothers and sisters, and they said the same thing. They just didn't know anything of Katie's past. In 1980, after 38 years of marriage, Gilbert Bennett died. Catherine's world began to crumble. When she lost Gilbert, she just lost everything, I guess. And uh, I had talked to Katie, concerned about her future. And I asked her if she had any living relatives. And she said, no, she didn't have a family. She was uh, raised in an orphan home, and she didn't know anything about a family. And she just uh, withdrew uh, some holidays and things like this. We asked her to come to dinner and stuff like this, and she wouldn't do that. And, and uh, we just couldn't, uh, couldn't keep in contact with her too long as a result of this. Catherine rarely left the home where she and Gilbert had spent so many years together. Mrs. Bennett? In the end, only the charity of neighbors kept her from total seclusion. Yeah, we just finished dinner and we had a few leftovers, so I made up a little plate for you. Oh, thank you. Sure. Uh, look, is there anything you need from the store? Oh, maybe? I don't think so. Okay. Thanks. Finally, in June of 1990, after 10 years alone, Catherine Bennett passed away. She was 80 years old. When no blood relatives could be located, representatives from the Oregon Division of State Lands were dispatched to Catherine's house to sort out her estate. This place in pretty poor condition. Really needs some yard work, that's for sure. Almost no one had entered the house in the 10 years since her husband had died. Oh boy, look at this. Her home was unkept, it was cluttered, it was dirty, it was flea infested. How long has it been like this? It had an odor, it was uh, as if a hermit had lived there. Mr. Bennett's clothing was still draped over the, the back of the chairs in the bedroom. It, you could hardly even walk through it. it. It was such a mess. Papers and bottles and trash and garbage and uneaten food. and. She had several animals, cats. There was cat food everywhere and cat food tins. And the fleas were unreal. Uh, you, you could just feel them all over you as you walked in. They just, it was, it was really bad. Our first job is to locate a will or locate heirs. And when we enter a home, we quickly sift through the personal papers, looking for letters, insurance policies, anything that might lead to an heir. The investigators never did find a will, but they were surprised to discover that despite the surroundings, Catherine Bennett was anything but destitute. They came across unopened Social Security checks dating back to 1981 and valued at more than $30,000. In addition to a large amount of loose change, they found a number of rare coins worth $1,500. Finally, investigators discovered that Catherine had squirreled away nearly $60,000 in two separate bank accounts. After her house was sold, the value of Catherine's estate rose to more than $125,000. Officials in Oregon have launched an extensive search for Catherine's heirs. Because her husband is dead, state law requires that the estate go to the nearest blood relative. What complicates the settling of Catherine's estate is the fact that almost nothing is known about her past, and much of what is known is fraught with contradiction. Catherine Bennett was born in Kansas City, Kansas in 1910. 
She once told her in-laws that she was raised in a Catholic orphanage after the death of her parents. However, in a document notarized in 1945, three years after she was married, Catherine presented a completely different story about her life. She declared that her father had died prior to her birth, but that her mother was still alive and married to Joseph Fayback of Kansas City. The document also made mention of a brother named Martin Irodovich. In the previous broadcast, we brought you the baffling case of Alex Cooper, a devoted husband and father of five who had disappeared without a trace. In April of 1987, Cooper's car was discovered abandoned a few miles from his home in British Columbia, Canada. Despite a massive search, no sign of him was ever found. A year later, Alex Cooper was legally declared dead I'm calling in regards to Alex Cooper, a uh, birth certificate. When his wife Margaret tried to obtain his birth certificate, she made an unsettling discovery. There were no official records in the name of her husband prior to their marriage in 1952. As far as anyone could tell, Alex Cooper simply did not and had never existed. Four years after he vanished, authorities learned that Alex Cooper was alive and well and living in Toronto, Canada. But before he could be questioned, Cooper disappeared again. I'd love to get him back. I want to give him a real big hug, and then I kind of want to give him a kick in the butt, and then another big hug. He's got this family that care about him. And if he's out there living among strangers, he should rethink this thing. We deserve it, and so does he. Who was Alex Cooper? Why had he assumed an alias and, in essence, lived a lie for more than 35 years? Shortly after this story aired, a viewer in Hamilton, Canada, recognized Alex Cooper and immediately called authorities. During questioning, the mystery surrounding his life began to unravel. Alex Cooper told police that his true name was Albin Arsenault. In 1948, he was accused of robbing an office of the Canadian Pacific Railroad, where he was employed at the time. I was young, and I panicked. And I said to myself, there is no way I'm going to be take the fall for this because I didn't do it. I took off at that time, and I became Alexander Cooper at that point. Four years later, Alex married Margaret, he had no idea that any criminal charges that might have been filed against him had probably been dropped. For more than 35 years, his true identity remained a secret. Then, as his 65th birthday neared, Alex Cooper's past began to catch up. I was due for pension, and you require to submit a birth certificate. I knew I couldn't produce one. Several months prior to this, I knew this was coming up. I couldn't bring myself about to tell my family. And so I walked away. It was a snap decision, and it was a wrong one. Two days after he was questioned by Hamilton authorities, Alex Cooper returned to British Columbia and was reunited with his family after more than five years. We're a very close family, and this has been very devastating for all of us, including Alice. And um, I'm really hoping that we can work through this and uh, put it back together, if not the way it is, maybe something better. We can't pick up where we left off because things have changed. But we're going to start fresh, take it a day at a time. The way I feel, I don't deserve for anybody to accept my apology. That what I'd done, abandonment of your family to me is one hell of a crime. And 
the biggest job for me at this point will be to make amends, and I would say it'll probably take me the rest of my life. Several months ago, we profiled the case of Charles Morgan, who was found dead in the remote Arizona desert. He had been shot once in the back of the head. The local sheriff's department ruled his death a suicide, even though the medical examiner classified it as unsolved. In the segment, we interviewed Arizona journalist Don Devereaux, who discovered evidence that Morgan had been part of an elaborate money laundering operation involving huge amounts of gold. Devereaux believes Morgan did not commit suicide, but was a victim of a professional contract killing. When the segment aired, we received hundreds of calls relating to Morgan's death. According to Devereaux, who continued his investigation, many turned out to be productive leads. Three months later, a draftsman at a Phoenix computer company, Doug Johnston, was found dead in his car outside his office. Johnston had been shot once behind the ear and police have suggested it was a possible suicide. Curiously, Johnson worked across the street from Don Devereaux's office and drove a car that almost exactly matched Devereaux's. In fact, Devereaux is now convinced that the bullet which killed Doug Johnston was intended for him. I got a phone call from a journalist a friend of mine uh, from Washington, D.C., uh, who had been briefed by a high-level CIA official uh, that, in fact, uh, that was a botched hit, uh, that some people thought they were hitting me when they shot the guy across the street. And, in fact, uh, there was a, a, still a contract outstanding, and it was coming around again, uh, that whatever I had done was still a problem to someone. Two other sources in the intelligence community have confirmed to Don Devereaux that he is a target for murder and that the next attempt will be made to look like an accident. We'll bring you a full report on this intriguing case in the near future. Join me next time for another intriguing edition of Unsolved Mysteries.